introduction about some of the stuff we've got coming up in the community and also a little bit about Adventures with Agile. Um, I'm going to take too long because obviously we're here to uh, hear Sean, so just a five minute sort of uh, intro from me. Um, we've got um, some excellent speakers coming up actually. Um, we've got uh, the first thing I wanted to let you know about was anyone who's involved in large scale scrum, that's Craig Rahman and Bass mm. uh, large scale scrum. Um, We've got uh, an initial kickoff um, on Thursday of this week for people who have already sort of either certified or have been doing it in their workplace. It's just a, um, it's a, um, at the Bishop's Finger to sort of set the tone for perhaps another regular meeting about, le uh, about less that then after the first one, then anyone with no experience will ever can come. So if anyone here has got that kind of experience, then um, you're more than welcome to come along to the Bishop's Finger. I've got the full address, I'll do that afterwards at uh, 6.30 on Thursday. Um, then in, um, in May, we've got Fabiola flying <coughs> over from the States to talk about HR. So anyone who's been involved in a large-scale agile transformation knows that HR is one of those areas which um, is one of the, possibly one of the last to ado uh, adopt agile in its processes. And that can cause a really um, big problem with some of the self-organization that we expect from agile, especially on scale. So Fabiola's got about four or five years' experience of um, helping HR departments with those kind of problems, and she's coming over here to um, give us a, another a, a free talk on that, so that should be pretty good. Uh, and then um, in uh, June, we've got, we're very lucky to have James Priest. Uh, so we were over at uh, Chris, I don't know if you know um, Chris, who's Think Spotify, basically. Um, they've got a great structure there about the way they work in their consultancy. Um, no one really owns the company. It's very, um, it's uh, non-exploitative. And so they introduced us to soci sociocracy and James Priest, and he's coming over to he's coming over to do a uh, talk on that. So that's excellent. Different type of organisational structure should be very interesting. Um, we've got so those are all free events. We've got uh, some training workshops coming up, which are um, which typically pay. We make some profit out of that, and that goes back into paying for these nights, that kind of thing, and advertising that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to be doing a two-day course on scaling agile. So I'll be covering the uh, framework, safe, less, dad and some of the tools like um, theory of constraints, real options, that kind of thing, and overcoming some of the problems which uh, we see when we do bottom-up transformation and top-down transformation and how they, can, how they can match up. So anyone who's going through that, that should be fairly useful. So that's a two-day course. Um, we've got um, uh, two large-scale Scrum uh, three-day courses, uh, one by uh, Buzz and one by Craig in September and uh, November. And then we have uh, Fabiola coming back to do an actual HR course for HR people. So something I might ask you actually is my circles of HR bots is extremely limited. So this course would really benefit HR people who are in an agile organization or someone who is trying to do agile. If, um, if, if you're in that kind of an organization, which you probably are for being here, if you wouldn't mind forwarding this meeting onto your HR people, if there's anyone you know, because it's kind of outside my circles and I think it would really benefit them. Um, so that's both the, the free one and, uh, and, and uh, the interesting one on the paper as well. Um, so we've also got a couple of other people which are coming up which haven't been formalised yet. People like Lisa Atkins, uh, Sharon Bowman. So if any of you have read training from the back of the room, it's an excellent book mm. if you're a trainer. So she has agreed to come over here as well to do a training course. And Lisa Atkins, so she was the one who got me into coaching in the first place. She is a brilliant trainer of coaches. And we're actually lucky enough to see her when we went over to Stockholm uh, last week. So. Um, some, we've got some excellent stuff coming up the remainder of the year as well. Um, so uh, this group is a Scrum Alliance user group, which means that if anyone is doing their um, Scrum Alliance uh, certification, then for every single event that you turn up to, you get a number of SEU points, and it's really one point per hour. So this is two hour session, so if you're on that track, then that's just two points uh, for turning up tonight. Uh, the other thing is, is that we're actually turning into a global community. Uh, when I started this off, uh, literally seven months ago, I thought it was going to be a bunch of people down the pub, um, you know, thinking that was going to be it, right? So, but it's actually gone crazy. Um, we've got um, people who've come out of the woodwork from who've got established communities from all over the world, saying they really like what we're doing here. We've got some great uh, speakers. What can they do to help? Can we help them? And uh, we've got a number of different people now um, who have communities which we're sharing uh, knowledge and speakers, etc all over the world, and I'm hoping that this is just going to grow and grow, so um, I'm not going to go into it now, but it actually opens up a huge amount of opportunities, so if anyone wants to talk about that afterwards, then just come and find me, because there's lo lots of uh, excitement about that. 
Um, a little bit about this community. So um, we're about 650 people doing various different things. There's lots of other things that go on, like um, we have talks about architecture, uh, email groups, um, discussion groups, that kind of thing. So again, talk to me afterwards or check out the website for these kind of things. It's about 650 people. Most of those are based in the UK at the moment. And then through the global network, there are, well, I mean, I can't even really say, it's well over a thousand um, other members who we can easily get in contact with and share knowledge, work, blog posts, all those kind of things. It's very easy to get hold of uh, good information that people are working on. Um, average Agile experience is about 5.8 years, so that's, um, um, it means that it's good discussion. So if, you, if you're new to Agile, you're going to learn a lot, and if, if you've been doing it for a long time, then you're going to find your peers here which to share some of these good things about. So it's quite an advanced group. Uh, you know, typical kind of people that belong to this, uh, etc. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that we talk a lot about frameworks, processes, all these kind of things, and this group is, is totally agnostic to any framework, any company, any agency. You're never going to get sold stuff um, while you're here. So that's something we're going to really keep across, and that's something we ask all of our um, uh, partners around the world. This is about this is really an altruistic group to share um, how we're going to make the world better by, by changing our organisations through Agile. So you're never going to get sold stuff while you're here. Um, so what we typically do is we have a YouTube channel, um, and every 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 uh, event I always say this. So, um, but we're trying to get to 300, right? Because we've got this horrible long URL, and YouTube won't let us change it until we get to 300 subscribers. So, please, if you do a search for Adventures with Agile on YouTube, you will find our group. Subscribe up, and when we get to 300, we can change the URL, and then we can. It'll be so much easier for everyone to find. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, you can remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to also say thank you uh, to Dan. He's uh, filming the event, which is what goes on YouTube. It's going to be an interesting one tonight because obviously we've got more workshops than uh, than someone presenting at the front. So we're going to see how that goes. But it means that we can share this, and other people now, uh, for example, we're going to get start getting videos from the events in Sydney onto our channel soon. So we'll be able to see some of the talks that are going on there. So I know uh, Dean Leffingwell is going to be talking in Sydney soon. We've got Mark Richards, um, who is uh, their CST over there. Uh, so there's loads of good stuff going on, basically. It's all going to be, we can all aggregate and, and have the benefit of it. So thank you for, for, for filming. Um, so feel free to tweet this evening, say how great it is or how awful it is or whatever. Um, that's our uh, Twitter handle. Yeah, I'm not handle. Really afraid of these things, but anyway, that's, that's our thing. So feel free to follow that as well. Thank you for the room. So Ben, uh, if you are, thank you very much for organising this, and thank you RBS um, for making this possible. So um, they've given us this room, and um, and you know without that, well we wouldn't have a day because rooms are extremely expensive. So thank you. Um, right, I'm nearly finished now. <laughs> so over to Sean. So um, Sean's 20 years experience in, in IT of delivery, and um, you know work with big small companies, and um, I mean, I've known Sean probably what, five months or so, and yeah. every time I talk to Sean, I learn something new, right? There's a huge amount of knowledge there, so I think we're actually quite privileged to ha have some of that knowledge shared with us this evening. So, over to you, Sean. Thanks very All right. much. Thank you very much, Simon. All right, so this is called picturing a problem. I have an initial problem. I've got two initial problems. First is technology, which Simon's already on top of. And the second is, I think this was advertised um, for me to co-present with Dave Putman. Unfortunately, he's not able to be with us tonight, and Dave is the one that's got all of the wit and charm, so you'll, <laughs> you'll have to kind of fill, fill that piece in for me. Right, so... Yeah, it's not quite up yet. Not quite up yet. Let's, um, let's see if we can make this work. Okay, so... Um, welcome again. Thank you again for the introduction, Simon. Um, I'm going to run a workshop tonight. The title of the workshop is called Picturing a Problem. Um, what this is really about is, is that we fall quite often into um, various thinking traps, um, particularly um, around linear thinking and cause and effect reasoning. So the kind of um, things that I'm thinking about are, for instance, as a, as a manager or a, or a product owner, if you increase the pressure on a team, you may see an increase, a very short-term increase in performance. But long-term, that may not necessarily be the right thing to do. And when we're actually trying to consider these things, it's useful to have tools and techniques 
um, to be able to um, figure out how we should be considering the, the dynamics of the system and how things are actually working together. So um, the again, I think Albert Einstein's quote is a good one. We can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So quite often in our day-to-day -day lives, we find ourselves working in environments where everything looks a little bit trapped and a little bit caught. So we need to sort of sometimes jiggle things and think of a slightly different way of framing the problem so that we can start to tackle it, um, which, is, which, is pretty, which is a pretty useful thing to do. So the tool we're going to talk about this evening are causal loop diagrams. And I guess I think quite a few people in the room are probably already familiar with causal loop, causal loop diagrams. So they're a great tool for working in a group with. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't do them alone, because I've got a lot of use out of these by actually just sitting and sketching, sketching these things out by myself. But actually, as a group facilitation discussion, or if there's something that you kind of think and want to um, share the model with someone else, it's quite good to sort of draw it out and say, hey, I think this is, this is how it works. We'll, we'll take a look at one in a minute. <coughs> We want to be able to generate insights and opportunities, um, really figure out how things are connected, how things are actually, how things are actually working. And also, if we're actually um, looking at the, sorry, I just need to flip on here, to consider if we want to make a change, if we want to, um, we've spotted something, we want to improve it, or we're stuck with something and we want to um, make a change, it's a good way of actually thinking through what we're about to do before just taking an action which may not have the effects that, that we think. So good, good times to actually use this tool. Um, I'll, just, I'll just run through a few because the great things about these diagrams is that they're generally applicable. So uh, some good times to use them. First, facilitating retrospectives. So if you have an issue um, that needs to be tackled in a retrospective and it's a, and you want again a, a good tool for working with a group to figure out what the root cause of the issue is and how you might want to address that it's a great tool for that um, if you're thinking about organizational change um, what are the dynamics involved in in doing that if you're an agile coach and you're thinking about an intervention um, and again, the reason I say this is these are generally applicable is because it work, this tool works for sort of individuals, um, teams, organizations, and actually the sort of larger society as a whole. So you can, you can map things at all of those different levels. And you know, another time which, when it's quite useful to call on a tech -like, technique like this is I would imagine that most of us have been in group discussions um, where you kind of get stuck. You feel it's all a bit circular and the same things keep on being raised but no one's really sure how or why to take things forward so again <coughs> then is a good point to actually say look here's you know let's actually start mapping this out and figuring out what's what's going on so again sorry for the slightly clunky mouse work here so here is a really 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 simple example i just want to run through this and i don't know if the guys at the back can see this um so Irene, you might be a good volunteer for, um, as I walk, if <laughs> I'll walk through this example, and it might be worth just making a note um, on the table of it. So a really, really simple example of a causal loop diagram is, um, imagine that I want to fill a glass of water. So I've got a desired water level. I know I've got, at the moment, an empty glass, and I want, I want some water in the glass. That means that I perceive a gap between the amount of water in the glass and the, and the um, water that I want. That means that I adjust the tap to increase the flow of water. The water flow increases, goes into the glass. I observe the current water level, and if the gap is closed, I'll adjust the tap position. So that's a very, very simple um, causal loop diagram. We've got variables and in things which influence those variables. And again, the gap here is, is between <coughs> what I want in the glass and what's actually in the glass. So. And again, this is um, a, a, bit, a bit strange, really. So when we say, I want to fill a glass of water, that's actually a good example of sort of applying something linearly. If we kind of pick this diagram apart, what we'll actually see is that if we just consider um, 
these two elements of the diagram, the water level is actually adjusting what I'm doing with my hand in terms of the tap position. It's actually, um, the dynamics of that are slightly different to, to what you may think. So I'm just going to go to a, another example. Um, so the first thing you'll spot is that the notation here is slightly different. And the, the reason I've not kept the notation all the same is simply because if you do any further research into this subject, whichever book or uh, resource you look at to actually find out more, they've all got different formats for the diagrams. But the underlying, the underlying structure is the same. So the example here is test-driven development. So one of the variables we have here at the top is the number of tests. We've got um, the more tests we have, the fewer defects we have. The fewer defects we have, the um, less time pressure we have. And the more time pressure we have, the fewer tests we have. So there's a, there's a loop there. So I kind of wish I had a clicker. Use the arrows. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Okay, so um, there's a couple of really simple examples and, and scenarios where we could use them. So quick three-minute exercises. Use the post-it notes to figure out if there's any, any um, topics you want to explore with these causal loop diagrams. And if you're, not, if you're not sure if something is a good topic, I could, I've got a list of examples that people can work through if they want because I know when I'm in a situation... Um, like this, I quite often can't think of good things to use. So I've got a list of topics if people want. And if, and if people just want to put suggestions out into the group on their table, um, and if people aren't sure if that would make a good diagram, they're quite happy to, quite happy to guide. So just, we'll just do that for two, three minutes. <laughs> right, so next, um, next, next part, just want to really um, run through what the, what the different elements of these diagrams are. Um, just before we sort of dive into producing some of them. So these things, nodes, they can be in clouds. You might want to use post-it notes um, to, make them, to make the diagrams easier to arrange or rearrange. Um, there's something which should ideally be measurable um, in some way, so something which is quantifiable. That doesn't mean you're going to quantify it, and it doesn't mean that it would be easy to quantify, but it should be something which has got uh, you know, some, well, some kind of dimension to it. Perceptions and feelings actually make good quantities, particularly when you're, when you're thinking about individual and team level um, <coughs> interactions. So things like happiness and motivation are all good candidates for, for coming onto a, onto a loop diagram like this. So sometimes it will be, you can take quite a technical view, like number of unit tests and, and uh, speed of team. Other times it will be, you'll want to think about motivation or, or how change will impact people. So good quantities. Where possible, try and keep your description of the quantity free from being good or bad um, generally tends to help um, help the diagrams flow so again just really want to reinforce the example so this cloud here I guess you can't see that at all at the back size of team, yeah. of team influences the number of people that interact with each other so that's you know that would be a good <coughs> a good influence if we put a spot or a dot on the line, that means it, it's inversely influencing it. So here, my thinking is, is that the more code reviews I do, so the higher the number of code reviews, the lower the number of defects. Yeah. So in that case, that's an opposite relationship. Because if I was doing more code reviews, I wouldn't expect the number of defects to go down. If I didn't think they were related, I wouldn't join them together on the diagram at all. And just the, f the final one to think about for the moment is um, delays. So here we've got cigarettes smoked, and there is a delay and symptoms of disease. Okay, so, so delays are a really, really important factor in systems. So in fact, let's think about that for a moment, right? So if um, you smoked a cigarette and you got the symptoms of disease from smoking within five minutes, how many people would actually smoke? Very, very few, right? So this. These kind of delay effects um, wreak all kinds of havoc in systems. One, just one other um, thing you may sometimes find, I don't generally tend to find this this often, but if you join two lines together like that, then you may sometimes find you've got a multiplying effect. So in this case, um, I'm looking at the hosting costs for my website. So I've got a number of servers, a cost per server, 
market forces impact the cost per server, particularly if you're, for instance, using cloud hosting. So the multiple of that is hosting costs. So you, it's sometimes worth, worth showing those on a diagram. Again, other things um, like that might be number of clients and um, time available for a client, for instance, as an opposite. So that actually is the, the most, basic, um, most basic parts of the notation. So uh, what I'm going to suggest is, is that we spend 10 minutes, and I'll, again, I'll set the timer, um, <coughs> picking some of the candidate problems. So working groups of two or three split the paper apart and um, have a go at diagramming some of, the, some of the things you've identified. And if anyone wants, if anyone's stuck for something, um, I've got a list. Actually, I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples here. So resistance to change, um, reducing over time, money as a reward, um, assumptions behind waterfall software development, um, how do I motivate my team to go faster? So there's some, there's some candidates if people have been stuck in, in, the, in the problem so identification. Well. Yeah. Diagram slide sure. and see what the notation was. Yep, there you go. Cool. All right, so 10 minutes and start sketching. <laughs> okay, so just very briefly, how did we get on with that exercise? Was that easy, hard, useful? Found it useful. Found the links to make a loop starting to get simpler, but I, maybe that was a, a kind of linear thinking as opposed to a causal loop. Yeah, you don't necessarily need to make loops or start off with loops. So um, it's, it's fine to sort of have a few variables that you think are connected and, and use that as a model. You'll tend, you, as you model more and more and more, you'll tend to find that, that thing is connected to that and that. So they start to become more obvious. They start to become more obvious. And, you, and again, you may start um, <coughs> picking some of the variables a bit more carefully because you, um, they become a bit easier to identify how they um, match with others. Any, any other observations? I wonder if you have extra layers or sorry, if you have delay, do you have opposite or delay? I don't normally show that on the diagram, um, although length of feedback is something you could always add onto the diagram. So there's nothing, there's no reason why you couldn't write five minutes, six months or 30, 30 seconds next to, a, next to a line if that was important for your, for your model. So again, it's, it's, it's kind of not, it's not really like UML, everyone's got their own techniques and notations for it. Yep. Uh, Mr. Travis mentioned that uh, we expect a delay, mm -hmm. but uh, as a result of this connection at all, we expect the reverse of this connection. How we draw that? Oh, show a delay in, a, in an inverse on the same line. That's fine. Like that. Exactly like that. We're going to have one of those in a minute. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> Okay, so I so want to sort of introduce a slightly a couple more things to um to this technique that may or may not be helpful. The fun uh quote here. More software projects have gone away from management's taking action based on incorrect system models and for all other causes combined. So I've kind of got a, a, a theory. Um, you know, as a, as a manager, one of the first things that you need to learn is observational skills, very good observational skills. And that gets you so far. The next thing you really need to learn is self-awareness skills. And that, that takes you to a whole, um, a whole new level of, of being able to get things done. And then third, you need to learn about how systems interrelate and how system models work um, and some of that more complex <coughs> thinking. So again, I'm pretty sure that we can all, it might be quite good fun actually, um, come up with stories where we've seen software projects damaged due to um, well-intended interventions that didn't necessarily um, do what people expected or what the intervener expected. So um, when we're doing these diagrams, we might actually start um, start to find some of these loops. So I just want to run through um, what, the, what these things are. So this is a, 
what we call a feedback loop, and they can be either positive, positive or negative. And the sign we normally use for that is like a snowball rolling down a hill because it's something which is um, in perpetual motion. So the, the example we've got here is that we've got a sales team, which is of a particular size. The bigger the sales team, the higher the number of orders that we can take. The more orders we can take, the more revenue we've got, the bigger the size of the sales team. So this is a positive feedback loop. As we go around the loop, it reinforces itself and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we'd end up with a, a massive sales team. More orders, more revenue. So it, it's a perpetual. You can have negative feedback loops as well, so things which reinforce on themselves and diminish. Um, there's an obvious problem with an unconstrained feedback loop. Another, <laughs> here's an example of a feedback loop and what we would call an escalation. So again, well, these are things that we actually see quite often. Um, the Cold War short a massive arms race between the United States and the USSR. Um, so the example I've got here is about children shouting at each other with a desire to be heard. So child A wants to be heard, increases the volume. Child B wants to be heard more. So child B shouts louder, child A shouts louder still. I'm sure they're not office workers. They're, they're office workers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but again, when, when we actually start to see these kind of escalations, then we can start to model them out. And when we do that, we can also start to include other factors that are feeding in or feeding out. So again, in the case of an arms race or a war against terrorism, um, USSR weapons means the US needs more weapons, which means, it, and so it feeds onto itself. Or child A got found a tango in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, th but this gets, it will probably come back to that Cold War escalation thing again. So this can get really destructive. You can, you know, we've seen in an, in an economy how much money can go on, on weapons. So the other thing that we'll generally tend to find then are balancing loops. So if those positive and negative feedback loops went on unchecked, well, the systems would destroy themselves. Either they'd be all consuming or they'd just disappear completely because, because they were negative. So typically, um, other relationships we find are going to be balancing. Um, this is a straightforward balancing loop, and we've got a new, a new one here. So I'll just walk through this one because I know people at the back probably can't see. So... What I'm saying here is, is that um, the time spent per client, so if we imagine, Simon, you're probably a good example of this. Um, Simon has a number of clients. The more time he spends with the client, the happier they are. The happier they are, the more referrals he gets. The more referrals he gets, the more clients he has, which has a negative impact on the time spent per client. And also there's a constraint because there's only so much time actually available to deal with clients. Okay, so there's a, there's a very real potential problem, and this is a good example of a balancing loop. It keeps itself in check because of the, because of the factors of the constraint. Is, does that make sense if I explain that? Okay. Okay, so, and again, if, um, if Simon's problem was the need to make, have more clients, then again, we can actually start to figure out how we can spend more time per client. Maybe we'd hire more staff. Maybe that would make clients less happy because they weren't dealing with the right person. You know, it's, these are all factors that we, can, that we can feed into our models. So, again, quite a common pattern that we'll find here is we've got these reinforcing loops, which if they were unchecked, they would simply run away. Um, so back to, the, back to the example of a sales team, number of orders, revenue, size of sales team. In this case, as the number of orders increase, the delivery time also increases, which makes sales more difficult, which reduces the number of orders. So in this case, we have a reinforcing loop, which would be destructive, balanced by a balancing loop on the other side. So it's worth, now we're kind of aware of, um, of those factors, figuring out if we can see any of those um, things, so, so I just need to sync up on here. Um, yeah, any of, any of those things in, um, in the systems that we see. So we, we generally tend to find balancing loops. I think the group um, at the back, you were looking at sprint length. So sprint length, um, 
the longer the sprint, the fewer interruptions the team have, the more momentum they get. But that's then balanced by the need to inspect the product frequently and potentially change direction and build the right thing. So there's a, a sort of fairly good example of a reinforcing and a balancing loop working together to, to keep a stable system. And again, that stability is important. Systems seek stability. We'll talk about that in a moment. So another very, very useful technique is, um, is to use graphs. So simple plots of, of, of some data. Um, and again, it doesn't need to be real data. It's just what, how you think something is, is working so you can explain it. So the example I've got here is um, a person's weight and the amount of exercise they do. So my assumption is, is that, um, in fact, I should probably have drawn that reverse, but the more optimal the weight, the higher the amount of exercise, which helps keep the weight <coughs> in balance. So we've got a kind of a decent balancing loop here. But actually, if the weight's too low, the exercise is going to drop off. If the weight's too high, the exercise is going to drop off. And when that happens, that's likely to become a, um, a reinforcing spiral loop. So, um, so again, just to make it easy to explain sometimes, it's worth annotating your diagram with a graph. And again, when we're thinking about things with those kind of dynamics, um, another really, really important thing to be on the lookout for are oscillations and overshoots. So um, again, I'll just walk through this example. Um, it's very similar to the tap one earlier. So I want to be at a desired temperature. And in the room, I actually perceive a temperature, say 18 degrees. There's a gap between the, the temperature I want it to be and the temperature that it actually is. So I adjust the heating or cooling in the room. There's a delay to, um, to the room temperature actually changing, or it changes in my perception of it. So, and again, this is kind of like, you know when you adjust a shower to get the temperature right, you move the shower head, you move the temperature in one direction, it's too hot. You move it back again, it's slightly too cold, and you move it one way and the other. It's that same effect, because when you move the shower head, uh, or the shower tap, you overshoot, undershoot, overshoot. So you tend to find these kind of oscillations. Other places we tend to find those kind of oscillations, um, uh, you know, in large organizations is in funding cycles. So it's never by intention, but um, I think of pretty much every organization I've worked in on a yearly basis, the funding available goes through this kind of sine wave where um, there's a lot of um, money taken at the beginning of the year, then everyone thinks there's no money left, and then actually people realize there's a lot more than they thought. And you end up with these kind of oscillations going on. So when you see something oscillating, there's some things to look for. Um, one of the most obvious things is to look for delays in feedback. Um, again, I'll give, another, I'll give another management example here. So an example of an oscillation is if um, someone's done something that I don't like, and I tell them very strongly that I didn't like them doing it. Maybe I lost my temper and shouted. Um, everyone's going to feel really, really terrible about that. So I'm then likely to overshoot um, and say, I'm really sorry about that. Here's a massive present. Let's go to the pub. Everything's fantastic. The person's going to feel fantastic again. And then, and then the thing that perhaps they did that I didn't like because we're now happy again, they're going to do it without realizing what it was, and I'm going to lose my temperature. Again, you, so you get a lot of these oscillations in human relationships as well. Um, again, very, very worth Oscillation is always something worth being attuned for. Seasonal effects. Um, if you're looking at, for instance, sales cycles or unit costs, you'll generally tend to find see these kind of oscillations, some of which you can or can't control. Um, one method of trying to deal with these things, if it's a problem, is buffers. Um, and yeah, the other one I would mention there is um, competing goals. So if you've got um, if you see something oscillating, you've got a team, even within one team, if there's competing goals within the team, again, you'll generally tend to see these kind of oscillations in some of the variables. So um, that's probably, probably enough on that one. 
Okay, so just the final one is everyone sort of probably quite familiar with butterfly effects or the idea that the butterfly flapping its wings in one part of the world can cause a hurricane elsewhere. elsewhere. So this is a, so systems absolutely do seek, seek stability. Um, so, you know, most of the time this is absolutely stable. We're all confident in the bank, so we don't have a desire to withdraw our funds for safety. So we don't withdraw many funds. So the funds held by the bank are fairly secure, which means that we've retained confidence in the bank. Okay, so again, these are all examples of variables that we can, we can use and reason about. Um, but there could be a very small rumour on bank liquidity, which would cause people to want to withdraw their funds for safety, which would increase the amount of funds withdrawn, which would reduce the number of funds held by the bank, which would reduce the confidence in the bank, and we've all of a sudden found ourselves with this reinforcing loop caused by actually a very small effect of, a, of perhaps a trivial rumour. So this is a very, very stable system which can very, very quickly be tipped into absolute um, chaos um, by some fairly small in, in, interactions. Another example um, where you might find butterfly effects um, working in organisations is if the senior leaders of an organisation um, say something unexpected to a team which is doing something quite stable. They will perhaps adjust their goals very, very quickly and there'll be a very large um, runaway effect as, as people move to try and do what the senior leader asked versus what they believe the system is meant to be doing. So again, the kind of very real effects that, that we can see. So again, as we're kind of looking at these systems and as we get more and more factors into the diagram, they become more complicated. There's a few things to remember. Um, now, the point about the reinforcing and feedback loops is, is that the systems that we see are almost, by definition, stable. So they're the ones that have survived because they're balanced. Systems which are going to destroy themselves have probably already destroyed themselves, and we're pretty clear that it's going to happen. So, you know, it's a survivorship bias. What we see is what is the systems that have survived. But over time, systems develop their own goals, which are quite often different from the espoused goal of a system. So I think um, one economist quite famously said that uh, GM was a pensions company with a, with a car factory attached. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> so we, we kind of see this we kind of see this stuff quite often, and there's implicit goals that appear as well. So one implicit goal that we quite often observe is the 70-hour work week, where there's a, it's almost like an escalation effect where the goal of everyone is to appear busy and spend 70 hours in the office. And so it's this kind of hidden system of people checking each other, sending emails late at night, all to prove that they spent that 70 hours in the office. Yeah, so, so when, we're, when we're thinking about the goal of a system, it's worth trying to separate out what you're actually seeing in terms of the dynamics versus what's there. So again, Observation is a key is a key skill. <coughs> so th another point here is that because the systems that we see are normally well balanced, they're extremely resilient and they get and they do get locked on. So um, you know, self organisation is is another talk in itself. But um, people in systems will self organise. They're always self organising, and this seems to be quite a mystery. That you know, if you've got a huddle of people in the kitchen complaining about something what they're actually doing is self-organising as part of a system. They're not self-organising in the way that the Scrum Master may want them to self-organise. And I've seen more than one agile coach come to a sticky end who was all into self-organisation without realising that self-organisation was, <laughs> was actually his, uh, his unpicking. Um, so self-organisation is a very, very powerful force. It's horribly misunderstood. You, you see it all the time. It's just... You know, as agile coaches and consultants, people use this term very loosely and they go, oh, the team will self-organise. Well, they, they already are. Um, you're just not a part of it yet, right? So, <laughs> just, yeah, it baffles me. So, um, we'll probably, we'll, we'll shorten this one down slightly. Um, given some of the new information uh, that, we've, that we've just had, it's probably worth re-examining some of the diagrams or adding some more factors to it um, and figuring out if any of those things are... Uh, relevant or makes sense. So any questions on any of that before we dive into the next topic?
we have the diagram back up of the, um, the one where there was this reinforcing one and the, that one? That one, that's yeah. That's quite a lot of notation. Yeah, we we haven't got a del we haven't got a delay in there. We could we could imagine a delay in here. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Let's um. Let's do, yeah, ten minutes. Maybe. Yeah. We might, might cut that a bit short. Oh. So, gonna move on. Talk. Talk about systems archetypes. Um, so there's a fun quote from Russ Acoff, who's a very famous systems thinker. I don't know if anyone's come across any of Russ Acoff's work. He's uh, worth, worth looking out. He's got um, something he calls F laws, which are a set of kind of management truisms um, based on a lot of his systems thinking works. So <laughs> the only managers that have simple problems have simple minds. Uh, <laughs> Problems that arise in organisations are almost always the products of interactions of parts of a system. Um, and again, this really comes back to that, um, you know, observational skills, self-awareness, and then a, a, an appreciation of systems dynamics um, is, is key. So let me just quickly talk about what arch archetypes are. So um, the, the they're a slightly controversial topic because the fear is, is that they constrain your thinking about a system by, by applying them. But I think they're useful to, we'll just do a quick run through of some of the more common ones. And again, we'll probably recognize some of these patterns in our own organizations or teams. Um, so what they are, if, I guess we've got a lot of developers in here, you know design patterns? So they're, almost, okay, so they're kind of like design patterns, but for, um, but for these systems dynamics. So. Here's a classic scrum master fail system dynamic. So we call this one shifting the burden, or it's very similar to one which we call eroding goals, or there's another one called shifting the burden to the intervener, but the, the, the general pattern is the same. So um, the scrum team needs a management task done. We've got something we could choose to do here, which has got a long delay, or we've got something we could do very, very <coughs> quickly, um, which we'll probably choose to do, for the purposes of this. So scrum team needs management task done. The scrum master completes the management task, which means that the management task doesn't need to be done anymore. As the scrum master completes the management task, he's lowered the need for the team to have self-management. It's a problem, um, which reduces the need or the ability for the scrum master to coach the team to self-manage. Uh, but we want the team to be self-managing, so this is the real underlying solution. Um, but the lack of the self-managing team, uh, or sorry, the more the team is self-managing, the less tasks the scrum master needs to do on behalf of the team. So again, you know, if we're, if we're working with scrum, quite a common anti-pattern with scrum is that the scrum master becomes the representative for the team, starts doing management tasks for the team and not actually teaching and coaching the team how to self-manage. Classic, you know, you see it in job adverts. A lot of those job adverts are the simple result of this shifting the burden to the intervener. Um, what, what do we do about this? Well, we have to be aware of it and we have to take the hard, the hard path more often than not. So um, there's, you'll see, again, you'll see other things. So um, the company I'm working with at the moment has got a large patching deficit. Um, they're putting together a project team to try and deal with the patching deficit. The underlying problem here is over the general patching policy and integration of that with the rest of the team. So we see these kind of patterns and dynamics quite often. So when we've, when we've got a tool to recognize them, um, it becomes easier to reason about them and make, make arguments towards more convincing and long-lasting change. So one of the things that we found in one of these papers over here was that um, some of these patterns, we already have preconceived ideas about how we would fix them. And so we model these out, and it's almost then a trivial exercise to figure out what you need to do to, to, to change that cycle. But what we were doing was actually saying, let's just choose one of the other boxes uh, at yeah. random, a thing that we wouldn't normally look at, and seeing what would happen if we affected that. Would that actually be a better solution to actually fixing this cycle? And we, we came up with a whole load of new ideas which actually would fix the cycle which we'd never thought of just by choosing a box at random. Yeah. That really helped. And again, the team in the corner found something quite similar. Um, and again, the, the really important thing is that when we do this exercise, it's not, 
we don't have right or wrong answers here. We simply have variables which may or may not be connected. So we've got, we've got some preconceived notions about what we think the right thing to do is, which is why we try and keep some of the emotional language out of it and use it as an inquiry and, on, and an opportunity to learn. No. But really, this is showing that there's actually potentially more than one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The, we, we wouldn't go into, we wouldn't use any of these models to, to make a claim like there was a single root cause. Um, this, this kind of technique is almost the sort of opposite of that, if you like. Um, because, uh, you know, if we were, everything is connected to everything else, and these systems are hierarchical. So. <laughs> All that we're doing when we do this exercise is taking a frame or taking a slice of the system and taking a look at it because that's what we want to reason with right now. Um, there's always going to be factors that you can pull in. You know, the temperature of the room may affect the team productivity. There's the the, the thing is is to yeah is to get them out there. Over motivation. So this group here had I love their diagram. It's so much energy and it's brilliant. Um, but they found a reinforcing loop of motivation. So we drew, a, I think we drew a graph in the end, didn't we, to show that, you know, motivation, there is an optimum. There's an optimum range. This team also found a dynamic with an optimum range. And as managers change, agents, scrum masters, um, just, you know, general people in society, it's worth being aware of those dynamics and being clear when they move out of range what kind of effects, consequences that would have and what you can do to, to impact that. Um, Here's, a, here's another classic, classic archetype, success to the successful. So um, the example we've got here is assignments given to Alice instead of Bob, which means Alice gets more assignments, which means that Alice becomes more successful, which means she gets more assignments. Bob, on the other hand, gets fewer assignments, less success, which means he get, then gets less success. So straight away, I think we can probably already think about some balancing loops that would help control this, but either way, the this is true. Okay, if we think of a software development team, um, if, if we have a success to the successful dynamic, so you've got the hero in the team that always picks up the tasks, what you're actually doing is, as a team, depriving others of the opportunity to learn and concentrating your failure point and over-optimism on, on an individual. So we see this time and time again. But not just at an individual level. If we've got multiple programs of work or product developments in an organization, success to the successful dynamic probably still exists. People, people start to have their favorites and unintentionally will then give more success to the favorites, which has a consequence to the, to the others. So individual, organizational, you'll, you'll see success to the successful quite often. <laughs> Yeah, and again, that kind of thing is, is really ripe for looking at um, balancing loops. So, you know, there are some natural balancing loops. And once you're aware that those balancing loops are there, you can kind of think about what factors are involved in keeping it balanced and is it worth attempting to disrupt them. Tragedy of the Commons is a, it's quite a big one, um, but again, quite a common one. I've got a budgetary example here, but typically the case of Tragedy of the Commons is if we've got a shared resource, a shared something, um, say, I don't know, a, a coal mine which everyone can dig coal from. Um, <coughs> the, basically, people are going to, on a reinforcing loop, take more and more of the resource for their personal gain, um, which increases the total uh, drain of the system which has a delay effect on the availability of things, and then all of a sudden it's too late to actually, um, to actually fix the problem of people taking all of the shared resource. So again, typical, typical ways of trying to control that are to stop the activity and allow replenishment, replenishment of the resource if it's something that can come back. Um, make it very clear through information what the destructiveness of these feedback loops is, or um, try and police the resource in some way. Um, to make sure it's being used. Yeah. But again, if you over-police it, you end up with a whole new bunch of trouble. It's all about, it's all about trying to find balances in the systems. So fixes that backfire. Again, slightly different notation. Um, the easier the product is to use, the more people use it, but the more familiar people become with it, 
generates resistance to upgrade the product. So again, we see fixes that backfire quite often. Um, a lot of management interventions um, generally tend to backfire. Um, uh, one that I'll put my hands up to, and I've, I've learned a lot better now, is, is that raising voice and shouting at people always backfires. Never do it, right? It just <laughs> never, ever works. One to be very careful of. Um, so we're kind of getting quite low on time. I don't know if there's any observations anyone wants to share about any of those things or anything that they found in the previous exercises. Yeah, or well, that could be that people, because they're not upgrading often, they get very used to the product, and yeah, so you build up, you build up another dynamic. All, all of these things can be reasoned about. Um, so, just another five minutes just to close it off. We probably, probably did want to spend longer, but we're um, don't want to overrun. You don't want to listen to me droning on all night either. Um, interventions. So, again, another great Russ Acoff quote: "There is nothing a manager wants done." that educated subordinates cannot undo. <laughs> it's that self-organization in practice again. Um, so what, hopefully one of the things we've seen is the, how, how these systems are balanced, how they seek stability and how resilient they are. Um, it, and again, one of, the, one of the dangers of these kind of exercises um, is that, Everybody wants to be a change agent. Everybody wants to be an expert. Um, it's, it's foolish and naive to think that, for instance, modifying some boxes on, on an organization chart is actually doing organizational design. Okay? It's, so it's, when, you're, when, you're, when you've got a systemic view of the world, you, you know you've got to be very, very careful because otherwise you just get smashed up against it. Uh, the other the other thing to be aware of is obviously select uh, selection bias so um, it, again this kind of activity especially when done with a group helps to deal with selection bias because a lot of people will again um, Simon probably knows a few people um, who can string along a fantastic story and they will have selected observations about their story which reinforce their belief so I did an agile transformation it was fantastic everyone was happy if we look at it systemically we can actually probably see that 95% of the people were pissed off, isolated and, and uninvolved. But that kind of self-selection bias of, of uh, confidence is a, is a real problem with, with interventions. So, so just to interrupt there, mm. you were saying um, that you have to be very careful about doing system design and how you might sort of um, butt up against some, um, smash up against the system if you like. So how would you not do that? It would, it would be sort of a series of experimentations, sort of prove your, pr prove your model, and then tweak it a bit, see what happens in real life, and, and sort of generally work through it, or something like that. Wait a slide. Okay. <laughs> Wait a slide. Um, so, yeah, just, just get myself right. So again, one other thing, um, not that I'm picking on Agile coaches this evening, because I'm not. I love them. I am one. Um, but when we're, again, planning an intervention, we've got to be very careful that any intervention we make is actually for the genuine benefit of those we're intervening with rather than for the benefit of the Agile coach. And a lot of people can't tell the difference. Okay? It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very tricky thing. So spending some time with a group of people modelling how it is you're thinking so that you have the opportunity to learn is really, really important. So this is a great acronym, POSIWID. The purpose of a system is what it does. Um, a guy called Stafford Beer came up with that. So we know that systems get locked on, and that's not really what POSIWID is saying. What POSIWID is saying is don't judge it. So don't look at a system and say, it's not agile, therefore I need to change it. POSIWID is saying don't judge the system, understand it, and if it's doing curious things, that's, the, that's its purpose. If people are working those 70-hour work weeks, that's become the purpose of the system. So, you know, read, 
read the system um, and don't judge it with, a, with, a, with your own frame as far as possible. Um, and again, I'll just very quickly talk about some of these intervention points, and I think we're pretty much done. So, so uh, Donella Meadows, there's a reading section at the back, has got um, a ranked list of interventions, which I've kind of cobbled up and, um, and put here. So from least desirable to most desirable, numbers, targets, and buffers. So again, we can probably think of some examples of numbers, targets, and buffers. Increase your story point velocity. That's someone trying to, that's someone trying to affect a change. It's a pretty poor way of doing it normally because the consequences aren't necessarily what you expect. But it can work. You know, there are times when that's appropriate and, and the right thing to do. It's a very simple way. So we kind of looked at delays in this. And we know that delays are destructive. They cause oscillations. They cause, um, they cause people to do things without realizing the consequences. So when you spot a delay in a system, you can quite often, by increasing the flow of information or, or, or radiating information about something having happened, um, will give people a, a sense of the consequence <coughs> of something. So, so I forget your name, but we had a great conversation about what constitutes a delay. So a delay is, I can't remember how we describe it. What was the, what did you say it was? It was just an, an, a non-observable, you know, you've got yeah. a step where you kind of see the effects of. Yeah, perfect, that's right. Yeah, so, so a delay is really when something is connected to something else, but it's not observable immediately. So that's when we use a delay. So anything you can do to reduce delays, um, waterfall software development processes are, are, are an issue. So delay reduction would be a potential useful thing there by maybe looking at an incremental, incremental approach. Or information flows, making sure that the consequences of something is recorded. So balancing feedback loops and identifying constraints. So um, there's, there's quite a lot of great literature around at the moment about um, building, um, self-designing, self-organizing, self-managing teams. And again, it relies on the concept of self-organization, but typically the way that the process is described and used is, is that the, the, the people in the room are given a set of constraints that they need to meet. So for instance, you need to form teams of between four and eight people. Um, other constraints are that you need this particular set of skills within each team. So by actually being clear about the constraints within which a, a system is working, you can actually um, maintain some good, um, some potentially good results. Again, balancing feedback loops. So if we think that something is moving out of control, and I think you know, our example there of over-motivation would be, a, you know, a good action would be to try and gently reduce motivation to keep it in its reasonable optimum. Um, so actually that's about identifying, this is about setting constraints. Um, and then just the final one is about transcending paradigms. So that's a, that's a tricky one. That's a big topic. Um, so again, was, as we approach um, working with systems, we, it's very, very difficult not to approach it without a frame of mind where we think that we know the answer and that we know what is right before we actually learn about the operation of the system and other people's interaction with that system and what that really means um, before we start to fling all kinds of interventions in which are simply attempting to put our own personality or our own ideas in place instead of actually a consensual, um, well-reasoned and thought-out view as to how things are. So this, this stuff is hard. Um, and like having a, a consent about uh, integration of your thinking. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you can genuinely let go of your assumptions and look purely at the dynamics of the system, that's, that's, that's how to do it. It's, very hard. <laughs> yeah, it's tough being human. <laughs> I spent three months and cost a million quid until realizing that what we were trying to fix is something that you would never try and fix. Yeah. It will work perfectly as it has been in place for a while, and you know you really don't want to go down that road. And I know you'd like to go down that road, it's not going to look good, but you know it looks bad because it's supposed to look bad. Yeah. <laughs> that was a hard lesson, actually. Yeah. 
But again, walking up the ladder, we've got a very, very, very powerful one here. And this tool actually does help um, to change <coughs> mindsets because as we collaborate and we learn from each other, because this tool is actually a learning tool which um, will work with almost anyone. It's easy to explain, it's easy to articulate. Sometimes you do this and you see a penny drop in terms of um, people's understandings of, for instance, agile software development versus um, current status quo or um, why their linear management actions aren't necessarily having the effects that they expected. And when you, see, when you get those penny dropping moments, all of a sudden, um, it, you, it, Ralph Stacey's done a lot of research on this, you know, the way that we, the way that we interact, and particularly in um, organisations and, and those kind of structures, the way that we actually will individually interact has a massive networking effect, huge networking effect. So, you know, spending time changing an individual's mindset through inquiry and, um, and consensus and being open to learning rather than telling will shift a, will shift a mindset and that will in turn help that person bring others to that new mindset. It's, it's very, very powerful, very, very powerful to watch. Very, yeah, quite amazing. Okay, so I think I've, uh, I think I've said enough. <laughs> so can, can people use this question? <coughs> So this this is for anyone really. Um, so as a group tool, it's very very useful for you know. Uh, I've used these as pro as a programmer to try and figure out the effects between multiple servers. So so they're generally applicable. So you can apply them to to a number of different domains and to a number of different levels from sort of uh, individual to all the way through to society. So my, you know my body is actually a set of balancing systems which keep it which keep it running. So it's fair game so I'd say that anyone can and should use these and use this as a facilitation tool. When a group has actually gone through this kind of exercise there's normally something that um, that exists so a, a diagram like this and I've never found it an issue myself to to show that diagram to someone else from a CIO to um, to anyone else on the team and say this is how we think things work yeah. right so this is you know we all feel we all feel demotivated we you know these are the things that we think are impacting our motivation do you agree this is our assumptions about about why this is and when you can just have that dialogue over something like that and you know give the other person the opportunity to cross it through or make their own adjustments to it that's quite powerful but they're, they're quite easy they're quite difficult to put together but they're quite easy to explain yeah. so it's so, um, So when we have this kind of like you know, uh, tool and you know we bring the, the whole team to come down and have a kind of like a you know, meeting for at least a half an hour or something. So will this kind of be kind of like a part of our retrospective? Will we give a person retrospective? Action? Yeah, it's a brilliant retrospective tool. Yeah. Absolutely awesome retrospective tool. Yeah, definitely. So again, if it was your sort of identifying problems or if the team has come across one particularly big problem, then this can be a good way to, again, fairly naturally pick that problem apart. So, recommend, there's a whole bunch of links here, we'll get this reading list on the AWA website. Do you want to share the slide? I'm all right to share the slide deck, yeah. yeah well that's, we can skip the yeah. and share the slide deck for, um, on, the, on the website. Yeah. Um, yeah, done. Well, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>